Welcome to another edition of A Century of Service, presented by the South Alberta Light Horse Regimental Association, Vignettes of Alberta's Military History. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Retired Robert McKenzie, and joining me today is Captain Don Gerling, CIC, and uh, our special guest today is the Reverend Dr. David John Carter. Mr. Speaker, retired politician, retired oh, Padre, HMCS Chippewa Naval Reserve, historian, custodian of St. Margaret's Church, author, Dean of Calgary Cathedral, archivist, developer, presently living, living south of Dunmore, and author of Prairie Wings, British Commonwealth Air Training Plan Number 34, Service Flying Training School, Medicine Hat. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So the Prairie Wings book, what prompted you to want to write a historical, um, uh, histori historical book about the, this yeah. particular? Well, uh, thank you for the question because it takes me all the way back long, long time when I was eight years old. And at that time, uh, I was, we were living in, uh, in Regina. My father had St. Mary's Church Regina. He taught at the college, and he was also padre to HMCS Queen in Regina. Anyway, I went to, uh, I was in grade two at the time at Davin uh, School, and uh, you've hit a nerve. It's the first and only time I ever played hooky. So what happened, uh, I was going to school and I looked down College Avenue to the west and there was a big yellow plane with smoke coming out of it and it f twisted in the air and it crashed. Now the Regina Airport from where I lived in school wasn't terribly far away. So a lot of us kids just started running, running, running off onto the prairie. We didn't get all the way up to the crash site but it was the image of the big yellow plane and the smoke and the crash and people being killed. So that brought the Second World War home to me in, in one of the various ways that it did. Uh, at that time, there was a bit of a training school there at Regina, which was later moved to uh, Pierce, Southern Alberta. And so uh, growing up as a child, you were aware of the sound of tiger moths going over and aware of the yellow aircraft that this was people being trained to fight the war because it's 1942, there's no guarantee the Allies are going to win the war. So we leap forward from that, we moved to Medicine Hat in June of 1949. And uh, again, one of the things about here uh, is the fact that it was a follow-up to the prisoner war camp which was here on the site where we are. And that part of that also links back to eight years old when, we, when I knew that the prisoners were being brought west and, as, uh, and our next door neighbor was in charge of the construction of the Beak Camps, Medicine Hat, and Lethbridge. Okay, so the two things came together. Why were the prisoners coming? And then why, then why were we seeing all these yellow aircraft around? Well, naturally, of course, then I would go up to the airport and, and look around at the buildings that were still left there, just as much as I came out to the prisoner war camp to see what buildings were left. So that's how I came into researching both books. But of course, uh, the training plan was uh, very exciting. It I can even go back further to this when I was in Gull Lake, Saskatchewan. So this takes us back to 19... 40, just before we moved to Regina. And one of my friends, he was a, an older teenager and he had a jalopy and he was kind enough to take me as then, what was I, five years old, something like that, around town. Well, later on I discovered that he enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force and he was shot down and killed in the next few years. So there's these kind of little threads that come in and say, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful to fly in a plane? And wouldn't it be wonderful to be a fighter pilot and go that kind of thing and shoot people down? But it's children, children. 
but as because of the question you've asked me, as I've thought about it here on the fly, fly is right when it comes to planes, that in fact there's some of the seeds of what later led to the story of this. And then again yesterday, uh, uh, it is yesterday in my mind in so many ways because I'm mentally going back to a lot of yesterdays. Is that when I came uh, when I worked for Tommy Cook, the undertaker here for a year, uh, not only did I see the, the graves of this 1952, 53, I can see the graves in my mental eye right now of the former prisoners of war, the 20 grave headstones. But I also then went over to the cross of sacrifice in the field of honor hillside and uh, I knew that my dad had blessed dedicated that big cross of sacrifice and right behind it are 50 graves 50 graves of men who were killed flying out of here in SFTS 34 so again being curious then I figure well one day I want to write about that but first I was writing about the prisoner of war thing and then I came around to this. Well, that's the shortest answer I can <laughs> give you, but short is not in my vocabulary. One of the things I found interesting is the politics that entered into Canada mm. becoming involved with the yeah. uh, uh, air training plant. Yeah. And uh, dates back to Mackenzie King in 1935. That's right. And, and in this book, and as I've reread it, I haven't read it in years, but I reread it again this week. And I find a lot of these, this is a real stumbling block. And this is a real surprise in terms of Canadian uh, democracy. Because as we know in retrospect, Hitler's approach to, to what he was doing in terms of uh, concentration camps and all that, plus the training for the Second World War, they were violating the terms of the Versailles Treaty, and certainly they were training their, the, they were developing their, not only their air power, but also their military power. So, and a lot of their training ground was, was the Spanish Civil War. So nevertheless, in all of this, uh, as early as 1935, and perhaps even part of 34, the British government were making approaches to Canada about train, training pilots. But Mackenzie King said no. And they were approached more than once, and he said no. And then when war broke out, there's this shameful thing that happened, that Mackenzie King, yes, he was trying to put, I suppose, bask in the glow that we were being more, we were being less dependent on, on the United Kingdom. So one of the, the uh, very senior air marshals out of uh, the UK came to Canada and again broached the subject about training in Canada and abruptly Mackenzie King is roared saying, we're not necessarily coming, what makes you think we're coming in on your side? Mm -hmm. Now that is scandalous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so again when war broke out, all of a sudden now you've got this desperate situation, you have to train pilots. And it's in, so that's 1939. And even there, Canada declared war a few days later than the Brits. I mean, trying to say, yeah, well, we're Canadians, okay. But, the, so then we have, uh, now we're starting to move, yes, okay, we'll do some training bases in Canada under the Royal Air Force, and then also under the Royal Canadian Air Force. So part of it is dealing with the identity of who's, a, of Canada as a country, you know, because of the word dominion and all the rest of it. So that enters into that, and that's covered in the book. To train pilots in England, of course, as, as, as recorded by John Rhodes in the book, that indeed, better to train in Western Canada. It might be freezing cold and all the rest, but you don't have any trees to fly into around Medicine Hat. <laughs> uh, you don't need to worry about Jerry coming up with a measurement 109 and blowing you out of blowing you to kingdom come so both Australia Rhodesia New Zealand did some initial training for pilots and then a lot of them were then shipped off to Canada for extensive training as fighter pilots bomber pilots and ground crew because let's face it ground crew are pretty essential or you're not going to be have the aircraft flying so that became part of the thing that eventually we came 
somewhat reluctantly into the situation where we have these almost 40 training establishments across Canada, but the bulk uh, where we are, it was the, under the Royal Air Force. And most of the ones who came here to train, and plus ground crew, had survived the Battle of Britain. But prior to that, if I may, the, the, bat the matter of Dunkirk is part of our whole story here. And one of, the, one of the photos we have is a Harvard, and the pilot is um, Werner, W-E-R-N-E-R. -E -E now, he had, he had enlisted when war broke out, 1940, and now we have the Germans pushing towards the channel. And so that's how we did this marvelous, incredible story of the rescue and the small boats coming out to get as many personnel out, both English and French, from, from the shores of Dunkirk. So you get the personnel back to England to train to fight another day. Meanwhile, they lost all their equipment and a lot, and many were captured. One, so in the battle of all this, when you have the accounts as much as in this recent book about Dunkirk, which is a very fine book and also a good movie, that the people on the ground said, well, where's the RAF? Well, the RAF, they were very few in number. So you had limited t uh, aircraft and they, were, they didn't have the capability, they didn't even come close to the capability from what the Germans had, having trained personnel in the Spanish Civil War. Well, Werner, we all talked about him very, for a moment, because so he volunteered and he went flying, he was up in a ferry battle. Now a ferry battle is sort of like a version of a Harvard, so you've got two people there, except it's not as powerful as a Harvard, it's <laughs> slow moving, so you've got the pilot and you've got a rear end gunner, so he can supposedly shoot down enemy aircraft. So what happened to uh, Captain Werner was he was, at that time, he was a sergeant pilot. So he, he was going up to fight and the, his parachute opened on the ground. So, okay, so he rolls up his parachute, stuffs it in, gets into the plane, goes off, you know, hoping that... <laughs> anyway, so he was shot down, his parachute did open. Oh boy, talk <laughs> about, uh, you know, doing your home homework, you know, let's do this. And, Anyway, so that means he's, he was eligible, what they call the Caterpillar Club, once mm -hmm. you've survived in par parachute training and especially. Okay, but he's on the ground and he's in full, you know, full battle gear. And uh, he's, he's dazed because he'd been knocked out. Along comes a young boy on a bicycle, looks at him, and then runs off and goes off in the other direction, comes back with farmers and all the rest with shotguns. So then Werner gets, they, because he hasn't got the French or whatever to deal with the locals, they then have him surrounded with about five people, the time to a tree, and then they start the shotgun. And, the, and he's worried because the one farmer, he's got the, the shotgun ready to fire. And so he figures, this is it, because they figure he's a German. <laughs> So this is the panic of war, and those of you with any kind of training experience wherever you are, the point is panic is all part of the, how do you assess the situation. Anyway, the long and the short of it, he, a, 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 a policeman came along, took him into the village, and again, people are throw, sh shouting at him like dirty Nazi and all the rest of them. And so eventually they keep him in jail overnight, and then along comes someone and says, yes, well, they open his battle dress and oh yeah, he's, he's RAF. <laughs> so they get him back to his training base where thou, this is, you know, we're still in Dunkirk, the confusion mm -hmm. and all the firing and all the rest of it. And, and the RAF is losing planes, plus in the, in the weather conditions. So he gets back to his base and the typical thing is commanding officer says, well, where, are you? where were you? What kept you away? Now get into a plane and get up in the sky again. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, this man eventually became a flight trainer in Medicine Hat for the whole war. Two weeks ago, I buried his widow. Hmm. Previously to all that, my father had buried Captain Werner. So the, this is the linkage over the years, and it comes back again to Prairie Wings. Again, that then takes us to, so after 1940, uh, again, 
uh, the ground troops had every reason to say, where the heck is the RAF? Well, we didn't have enough planes. And the plane, yes, there were a few spitfires and hurricanes starting to appear in all this, thank goodness, because they were two of the weapons which really helped in the, when you come to the Battle of Britain, which happened a few months later than the Dunkirk story. What is seldom uh, noted is the fact that how the fighting over Britain, there was an advantage to it. What was the advantage? Spitfire pilots and Hurricane, they would be up in the air, f fly a few sorties down on the ground, right around, turn around, back up, back around up. Whereas the German fighters, of course, had to go all the way back to France and, the, and then reload, come back. And it wasn't like in the movies where you see a Spitfire can you know, what, spill out like 2,000 bullets. No, sir. They, they only had limited supply. You could do the burst, burst, then you had to go down mm -hmm. and re refuel, reload. It is known that if Hitler had gone one more week with the Battle of Britain, he probably would have won the Battle of Britain in the air. The reason being, Britain was running out of pilots. They could fabric together, they could repair planes that had been smashed on the ground. And in fact, uh, one of my relatives during the war worked at a, a repair shop for hurricanes and, and for Spitfires at Coventry. Later on, that's one of the reasons why the Germans wanted to bomb Coventry was because of repair to aircraft. Nevertheless, so out of all this, the British did win, the Allies did win the Battle of Britain. And then we have those famous words of Churchill, never, you know, how much we owe to so few, few men. Mm -hmm. Now, when you watch the great movie, The Battle of Britain, in which Michael Caine is one mm -hmm. of the stars, you're very much aware of the fact that the planes are taking off from tarmac, but here's the other thing, where else are they flying on and off? I'm asking you. Well, it's uh, dirt, uh, grass, grass strips, grass strips, all over England. Very much. And now the reason I asked you that is because now we come to Medicine Hat. And now, like every base in Canada, had you had a landing strip, which was paved to some degree with asphalt. And the one of the photos we have here of the Medicine Hat station, an aerial. You see, it's like a triangle shape, and that was the basic thing. But you also have to have two relief stations, just in case there was a big accident on the field, which happened here a number of times. So then you had a relief strip, which was down Wholesome Road, and that Wholesome mm -hmm. station, it was uh, less of a strip, very few buildings, but again, it, was, it, it had uh, asphalt. We also then had a, another relief station, which was south of Whitlaw, and to try to find it, it's really between Whitlaw and uh, uh, what's the coulee west of town with all the, anyway, it, it's sort of yeah. west of Wholesome again. Mm -hmm. So, you, and then you had to train your pilots in the early years of the war because the station opened in April, March of 1941. You still had to train them to be able to land and take off on different strips, Surfaces. obviously. And of course, that came into play whether you're talking about another RAF base at uh, Swift Current or Moose Jaw or Calgary. You have to have at least two relief bases, again, because of weather conditions, crash conditions. And that's how we ended up having the relief uh, base at uh, Relief Strip at Holson. The thing about Holson, for a moment, is that's where our first fatal crash occurred. Um, a fellow by the name of Ernie Bacon. And uh, Ernie Bacon was born in Canada, but he went over early in the war, and so he ended up being trained in England as an RAF mm -hmm. personnel. When the, uh, f after the Battle of Britain, it was shortly after that, then they gathered together as many instructors and grand crew as they could find, and then they shipped them to Canada. They all were brought together in a place called Wimslow uh, in the Midlands. I went through there about a month ago. And uh, then they were shipped uh, from Greenock to 
in a in a requisitioned uh, Polish uh, passenger liner. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was another ship transporting their their aircraft. Okay, now remember, Canada was given as training equipment beat up old junk that had somehow survived Dunkirk and and the Battle of Britain. At this stage, the good thing was that technologically they were working with this, in particular, with the fighter pilots and the fighter aircraft for both the Hurricane and the Spitfire. So, uh, the group that were coming to Medicine Hat in April 41, their ship got here safely. However, they were across in the distance in the convoy, the ship carrying their planes was torpedoed. <laughs> so they got to Canada, and they, so what to do? Well, they get moved across the country, and the, the account in the book is good. You know, they get to Medicine mm -hmm. Hat, and they're welcomed by everybody. They're ferried up to the base. You know, people in cars and trucks are just so happy to see them. Again, we're mentally, and in your imagination, please see Medicine Hat, 1940. See yourself as down at the railway station. You can walk there. Why not walk there at night when there's mm -hmm. no, nobody around? It just sort of sense the fact. Mm -hmm. This is Medicine Hat. There's like nobody beyond uh, Dunmore Hill. Mm -hmm. And there's no, but like hardly anything over in Riverside. And to get to the airport, this was a big journey because, you know, where did the road to Lethbridge end going up towards the airport? It ended like Connaught School. Mm -hmm. So they ferried them all up there and then of course they had to deal with winter conditions later on. For a moment, these pilots and ground crew who survived the Battle of Britain, uh, one pilot who deserves a very important, well they all do, but who's known to many people perhaps um, in Medicine Hat and area today was Reg Nutter. Now Reg fought in the Battle of Britain. Uh, I think in the Battle of Britain he was flying a hurricane. Anyway, mm -hmm. So he came back here and for years he, uh, of course he married a local girl, why not? They're pretty. And he, so he ended up being the industrial arts instructor up at Medicine Hat High School. All right, so he had experience in the Battle of Britain. That's what you needed. You need to have pilot instructors who had experience. You also have to remember, when they came back, they were all, they were old men. They were like 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was one instructor here, he was 35. And they said, you know, and he was their best instructor. He said, you know, he was an old man. <laughs> and then the fellow who ran the base, he was an old, he was 60 years. You and I can't, some of us here can't remember being 60 years old. <laughs> Nevertheless, and with the ground crew, a uh, very fine man. Less man. And uh, again, in the last couple of years, I've been honored to bury both his wife and then himself. And, and Les and his wife were great. They're a good part of the book because they kept this marvelous scrapbook throughout the war. But I can still remember Les saying to me, he was at, the, he was at Biggin Hill, greater London mm -hmm. area, during the Battle of Britain. And uh, they remember the barrage balloons you know, to try to mm -hmm. impede the, the bombers or whatever coming. And, and Les Mann said at Began Hill, there, there is a bit of a hill. And they can remember <laughs> not just one day where they would be out working on the planes and all of a sudden the other side of the hill from the coming in from the valley below and then rising up the Messerschmitt 109, spraying them with bullets and of course everybody runs from You can't read. I mean, to be able to reach back and talk to these people, mm -hmm. it, it was fantastic because it's like, <laughs> I suppose in another way, aside from being a historian and researcher, part of it is I can feel right now, and I kid you not, I can feel the hair going up in the back of my mm -hmm. spine because I was so privileged to be able to listen to somebody from the Battle of Britain mm -hmm. right there, all guns blazing. Mm -hmm. So this was part of the whole makeup of Service Flying Training School, Medicine Hat. Now the, uh, 
How large was the service flying training school? How many people, how many pilots did they train during the war? Well, there's a, the numbers vary a little bit, but generally it's accepted that there were about 2,000 pilots and ground crew. And out of that, there's just, there, is about, there are 50 graves behind the Cross of Sacrifice in the Hillside Cemetery. Most of those uh, deaths were because of, <laughs> were, uh, most of them were caused by stunting in front of pretty girls. <laughs> uh, and when I wrote my book and did my research about the Prisoner of War book, the eight different times that I was able to be with, in, in Germany and speaking one-on-one -on -one with these folks, that I would say, okay, well, there had to be crashes during training in particular. And, you know, what happened? They said, well, part of it was moving from a lighter aircraft, if I may say, like from a Tiger Moth mm -hmm. here to a Harvard. That's quite a journey. Mm -hmm. uh, that over there, that going from a lighter aircraft to a stronger aircraft. And the other problem was we lost a lot of them stunting in front of pretty girls. <laughs> And so one of the early crashes here happened about six miles west of Vauxhall. And uh, this day they were flying an Oxford, an airspeed Oxford. <clears throat> so that's two engine bomber type. But remember, we're, this is still the early days of flight and learning, you know, better <laughs> equipment and all the rest. And so this wasn't, anyway, so they, they came to Medicine Hat to be bomber pilots initially. But as I mentioned earlier, their planes got to the bottom of the ocean. So when they did get here, they had to scrounge <coughs> around. So a few Anson came from Calgary. They picked up some um, Harvards from Moose Jaw. They would even have to fly all the way to Nova Scotia to fly back, some of the Harvards. So basically for aircraft here, it was sort of like, it was a, well, I don't want to say a garbage department, but they mm -hmm. were having to pull from here, there, and everywhere just to get the base operated. Anyway, to go back to this crash west of Vauxhall, this day two of their, two of their best training pilots decided, well, they would take a flight with the, with the airspeed Oxford. So they brought along one of the ground crew just to check the engines, but also because you also give them a joyride, bring them along with mm -hmm. you. Only trouble, this was a heck of a joyride. So they, they're flying over near Vauxhall, but, but it turns out that the two, the pilot and co-pilot, were also dating the two daughters of the Hildebrand family. <laughs> so they had been, you know, to dances and all the rest of it, which is a great feature of, of the Air Force Base here because the community welcomed it with open arms. Anyway, so this day they're stunting and they make one pass and then they come back, crash, all three are killed, stunting in front of pretty girls. <laughs> okay. Well, every male who's watching this on TV understands that, that approach to life. It's part an essential part of life. However, from Wholesome, the very first crash at Wholesome is, uh, may well have factored into this airspeed Oxford, but the first crash at Wholesome was uh, 11.30 at night. Again, so it's dark. It's not a moonless night. I mean, it's not a, a night with moon, so it's black. Uh, when you visualize right now, coming out of either our, our main airport here, and you're flying north, you're coming up over the Saskatchewan Valley, right? Same thing when you come out of Wholesome, as you're pulling out. So Gus Bacon, whom I referred to earlier, he's on duty that night and he watches the, this plane take off with two men aboard and they go off in the dark and he sees the tail, the white tail light and then all of a sudden he st they don't, they crash about a mile or two west of Wholesome, but it's on the prairie. So they go running over there and uh, Gus Bacon pulls both bodies out of the burning aircraft. The one fellow's dead on the spot, they get an ambulance out, and the second fellow dies between there and Medicine Hat, which is a long way in those days. Remember, it's a gravel road. Mm -hmm. 
and cars don't rip all that fast. So when they did the investigation, uh, they discovered what was the problem was, and it happened with another aircraft before they finally straightened it out. The uh, horizon indicator wasn't set properly. They brought the aircraft in from, excuse me, the camera, I'm still flying myself. They brought them in from Moose Jaw. So it had an entirely different setting because we had a different elevation than Moose Jaw. So when they took off, they were in the dark, they're relying on the horizon. Hmm. So it took them a while to get that one figured out, you know, but so it's mechanical in that sense. While we're, you know, while I'm leading you uh, along the flight plan here, when they went on navigational things, they would do a triangular flight. So one of the, two of the indicators that they, that they really enjoyed was the fact they could, they knew where to find the Cypress Hills. Hey, often they would go out on weekends, you know, for the lake and so forth. So if you got lost, you can look on the horizon and see, you know, about half a mile from where I live is the height of the Cypress Hills. So at least you knew where they were. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, and across the prairies, and, and it's noted on the back of this book in the painting which was done, and it, it, it was done by an artist who had served in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he's in, uh, Mr. Bliss in Vancouver. And the back of the, this book should, does show you, and I think an image will come up on the screen at some stage, and it shows aircraft flying on a winter scene and it's got to be in Saskatchewan and uh, what it shows is a little town and a railway track and the interesting name on the back of the grain elevator is a fictional place in Saskatchewan called Moose Crotch. <laughs> well, you know, whether, no matter where you are in the services, hey, you've got to have humor and we all josh each other and all the rest of it. Well, sadly, the, this picture on the back illustrates another terrible, the worst accident for Medicine Hat. And it took place uh, in March 43, up towards Hanna. Or you come a bit this way, Rosebud, which is now just a big coal mine place, the town's gone. But in act, this is what happened. There was an Anson. Now, an Anson in those days was supposed <coughs> to be a real big aircraft. Well, we. You know, if you remember seeing them, they were kind of slow moving things. But nevertheless, they were taking a, this uh, pilot, Grellis, and I think we have his uh, grave marker on the, somewhere in this uh, presentation. And he was from Scotland. Nevertheless, so there were five, on, he went up with his four, with his three, it was a four man crew. Well, they went mechanical up there, so they landed in this field. And it's, you know, it's the snow on the ground and all the rest of it. They needed a new battery because there was a, had a bit of a fire coming. So they stayed the night. Then they stayed, and of course, they stayed with the farmer. The farmer had daughters, you know, so it was <laughs> all very jolly. Um, you know, I'm sure in those days it was all above board, but they, you know, it was, it was friendly. So the next day they brought up another Harvard to bring the battery, and it, turned turtle in the, in the plowed field, so okay. Then they uh, brought another aircraft and it had, had problems too. The long part of the story is that then they got the battery, they got the Anson up and they're flying, and they go up and they do a, a turn around this tiny little town, and then they come back again, and of course when they're doing it, I mean, they've gone the flight to say thank you to everybody for the hospitality and so forth. So all the kids in the school, the little, you know, like a two-room schoolhouse. I mean, this is the biggest thing since mm -hmm. sliced bread. And so they're all out there, and there happened to be a freight train in the station. And so the, every, the curve of the, uh, the train are out there. Everybody, I mean, they're all looking up all this. And while they came around, and they come around the second time, he flies it so low that the tail, the fixed tail wing, uh, wheel, wheel, catches the the false top of the roof of the small school, not of the school, of the store. Okay, now pause for a moment. How big is this, this store? 
the false front would be like 12 feet off the ground, the, false, the top of it. And so the later inquiry did show that they were that low, and as they pulled up, it was the tail wheel, cart wheeled. So some of them were obviously dead on the spot, caught fire. The train, steam, had enough steam, uh, you know, they were ready to roll. So they loaded two guys on there, went into Haver, into Hannah, and uh, one died en route to Hannah, the other one died right away. And then we have this terrible reflection on this story because a fellow by the name of John Rhodes, who does f f form uh, quite a lot in this book, he went up on the he was up there right away in the investigation. He went into Hannah, and uh, so he he went and viewed the bodies, and the undertaker was showing him the whole business, and uh, so then they went next door to have dinner in the cafe, and John Rhodes, he's at uh, that time a flight instructor. He looks sideways, and here's the undertaker eating his food, not having with burnt flesh on his hands eating his lunch. <laughs> well, okay. So this is pretty gruesome stuff, isn't it? But this is the reality of life, as you know. Mm -hmm. No matter what, what kind of jaws we have in this world, something like that can happen. But I, I'm just giving this flavor, terribly used flavor after that story, but nevertheless, the flavor of what they had to put up with you. Again, it was interesting times. If I may, there's one story I really want to share with you, and I'm going to refer to the book just very briefly, because this is a wonderful, curious connection to Medicine Hat. Now, I had mentioned about Reg Nutter, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. been in the Battle of Britain, came back here, and he was, he was the flight instructor for this particular fellow. Now, very briefly, the youngest pilot trained in this base was, his last name was Dobney. Okay. So he enlisted, he sent in, he sent in his application from the Royal Air Force. He was 14 years old. <laughs> so by mail he sent in the documents and they said show up at the recruitment office. So he did and they, and they took him on right away. And they and the because they were so busy, you know, just the Battle of Britain, everything's in chaos. Where are we going? And they said, "Why well, is your birth certificate?" And he said, "Well, I put it in the mail." They said, "I put it in the mail." He says, "Well, how old are you?" He says, "Well, I'm 18." So mm -hmm. I put it in the mail. They let him go through all the training and the rest of it. Anyway, he gets shipped out to Medicine Hat. Okay. Well, very quickly, what happens to him? He's trained as a pilot. They put him in an RAF bomber. He's the pilot. He is 15 years old. <laughs> and he says, well, the rest of the crew thought I was pretty good, you know, I was a very good pilot. And they were all old men, they were in their 20s. <laughs> and he made three flights over occupied Europe. 15 years old, 15 and a half by now. Trained here in Medicine Hat. On his third bombing uh, mission, while they were scattering leaflets or whatever, and one of his close friends got blown out of the sky. And so that's when he decided, well, I'm gonna apply to go to uh, Coastal Command. That might be safer. <laughs> so he went through transfers and all. So he, one day he gets called into the office and uh, he's expecting he's gonna get word that he's gonna get moved to a different part of the theater of war. And he walks through the door and there's his father and his father says, because he and his mother had been as separated, and his mother says, yes, boy, and now I've told them you're real age, and then they, then they decommissioned him. However, so he's out, he's working and repairing aircraft somewhere, and he said, no, so he tries it again. He wants to go to the fleet air arm. <laughs> so at 16, he, try, he goes, and you know, he's qualified. Then they find out his age again, and you're down. <laughs> you know, so here, I mean, this is just an interesting bumble on here in, the, in this particular story. Yeah. So well, you talked about um, the crashes, and I, I've flown in a Harvard, and I know that the, the actual frame that you sit in is like a big roll cage. 
Um, what was the survivability like? In uh, there must have been crashes where people survived because it, it it would seem that way to me. Well, there were there were quite a number of crashes early on here because because uh, again, as we referred to, you're in such a hurry to train. You could you could uh, as little as four hours training, you could be flying solo, and not just in Tiger Moths or with some of the other air, others lighter uh, aircraft. But again, with Harvard's, and as you know far better than I, when you're in there, you can't see ahead if you're on takeoff. No, you're back to the instruments, hey? And you can't sort of lean, you could have to swerve your aircraft a bit this way to be able to, you know, you could do that, right? So there were a number of training accidents here, and for a while they had to shut them. They would slow down the program and do much more instruction in the classroom before you did get up there. Of course, the other thing is, once you've been doing it, you were flying and doing all your circuits, then you came back, and you know the wonderful thing, which is very much the way the Army and the, and the Navy and the Air Force runs, you gotta march on the parade ground. You gotta do your guard duty, and then we'll let you go back and fly again. <laughs> and you know that far better than I. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, one interesting story was uh, how they got Harvard from the U.S. at one time, <laughs> yeah. except uh, uh, international treaties at that time, the uh, yeah. U.S. was neutral, was not involved with the war, yeah. and there was, uh, they had to get the aircraft into Canada, but yeah. because of international treaties, they couldn't fly yeah. them into Canada. Yeah. That's one of the delightful things yeah. uh, in this, that. Uh, and so this kind of thing happened at uh, Sweetgrass. It also happened in uh, southern Manitoba. And this is all prior to December the 7th, 1941, 41. when the U.S. finally did come in, although they were, they were helping in different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Harvard is basically, was developed in the States as a, what they call a TEXA, T-E-X-A-M. Mm -hmm. So they had a number of these, and yes, they would fly them up to the border, very close to the border. And then they would have the local rancher or whatever, whoever was skilled, lasso the wheel, and then they would pull them into Canada, and that way <laughs> they, were, they didn't affect the neutrality of the United States. Yeah. So no, it's great stories, and they did indeed happen. Um, yeah, yeah, hauling across the border, landed in a field and hauled across the border with a team of horses. Yep, yep. And then they got in and flew yep. them up. <laughs> and that's how we got to Harvard. The other thing about you being in a Harvard is the fact that uh, for people on the ground, once you've heard of Harvard, you, you'll always remember it. Forgive me, song crew, but I mean, you remember that for your life. Because, I mean, that... It it's wasn't as scary as a Stuka dive bomber, which would mm -hmm. scream, scream, and drop a bomb on you and fire. But for training purposes, Harvard's were excellent. And so again, in medicine, that they trained both fighter pilots and bomber pilots. And as you know, that the first number of graduates out of medicine hat who went to bomber command, bomber command, the attrition rate was god awful. It was quite comparable to the attrition rate for German U-boats. You know, you would lose about at least 60, 65 percent of your crew. But again, in the context of the early days of the Second World War, we were talking about confusion and mm -hmm. chaos, panic. We got to get this done as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. Now, uh, the layout of the airport, uh, growing up as you grew up in Medicine Hat, and I did, and uh, I remember going out to the airport where they had the green hangars along the uh, edge of the mm -hmm. runway and a lot of buildings still yeah. existed in that. In fact, if you go up there now, you notice that some of the avenues are Harvard, uh, Anson, uh, named after aircraft in that area. Yeah. But uh, how big was the... Uh, uh, well, the whole installation? Yeah. Well, they were carbon copies plumped yep. here all the way across Canada so that, if, for example, um, till recent years there was a, a number of surviving buildings at Fort McLeod 
which had many more of the uh, officer buildings, mm -hmm. bigger towers, and they, even at one stage a few years ago, they still had the control tower. But so you had basic carbon copies across the country. And of course, this was again uh, economy of scale, mm -hmm. because then you only had to run off uh, uh, blueprints and ship them out to the mm -hmm. contractors wherever you could find available personnel materials to construct. So it was economy of scale. And you're right, yes, even today we have the uh, street names up there where it's basically uh, uh, trailer, mm -hmm. nice trailer installations. In fact, I sold a book there a couple of days ago, and again on de Havilland mm -hmm. Avenue. Uh, the thing that, and there's an Anson, but sadly enough, as I recall, there's not a Harvard. And yet Harvard yeah. was the main machine going out of here. So maybe there is a, an Oxford up there. The problem yep, is there is an know. Oxford Street. So, but again, the Oxford uh, were they were pretty poor bomber training things. Mm -hmm. There was a bombing range out of here too. It was north of the river, uh, a bit west of um, Redcliffe, and that's where they would go and drop these dummy bombs. And all you had was, you know, a big uh, kind of triangular pyramid log thing out in the middle of the field and you're trying to hit it with a bomb that was about like a five pound bomb or whatever. Uh, when you go towards Musha and you come close to Old Wives Lake, mm -hmm. um, because there was a very uh, big installation in Moss Bank, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. and it was bombing and gunnery, so they would go out and they would, they could bomb into Old Wives Lake and no fear of killing anybody. Mm -hmm. So again, you had to try to train them in firing ranges. Uh, you remember the uh, concrete uh, firing gun butts yep. as well that stood up high and then you were shooting there. But again, that takes you back when you're trying to... Ammunition is limited, period, so that even with training, you need to try to, you know, center your guns that you don't have for... When it comes to live ammunition, you can only get so much training. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes in the Battle of Britain, for example, uh, pilots go up in the air the first time they ever fired a gun was get on a plane get up there and try to shoot down a German. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well they went up with very little training and they right. lost a lot of pilots. That's right. At that time and then that's when they finally realized they had to give more training to ensure their survivability. Yeah. Well they had the first thing number one you had, get, you had to get them at least to be able to fly a plane and hopefully you can shoot. Because in the desperate moments, the desperate moments of those last few weeks of the Battle of Britain, I mean, er Churchill's right, everything just hang, hung in the balance, hung in the balance, and it came so razor thin. And then, because uh, Hitler and Goering and their wisdom pulled back, uh, worrying about the Russians and all the rest of it, that, that, there was an, a, that gave a little bit of breathing space for you know, countries like Canada to pull their weight in the training. And of course, the other thing was that a lot of the people who were doing the training, they were cheesed off that they were stuck in places like Medicine Hat when they wanted to be there on the front line going after Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one comment in here about one of the medical officers who had been conscripted into the Royal Air Force, and he was one of the, he was one of the professionals on the famous Harley Street in London, but he got conscripted. He ended up being here as a medical officer, and his comment about being in Medicine Hat was not fl flattering. It was something to do with the boil on the backside in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but the people of Medicine Hat were very forgiving because the dances and people yep. coming into the homes, I mean, it was wonderful. And so it, we welcomed people, for, uh, pilot trainees from around the world, you know, because there were Czech, Czechoslovakians, there were Polish, People from New Zealand, from Australia, uh, Free French, one of the graves in uh, the 50 graves there behind the cross mm -hmm. of sacrifice. Uh, I'll tell you something which I haven't shared with too many people, but when I published this book in about the year 2000, uh, the very first thing I did, I, I print all my books locally, the, the very first thing I did, I took this book from uh, Holmes Printing on Dunmore Road, and I walked to the Cross of Sacrifice, I walked behind it, 
and I held it in my hand like this and I said, this guys, this is for you, so you'll never be entirely forgotten. Let's get into uh, a little bit on how you research this, because this was before the time of uh, uh, computers. You'd gathered a bunch of stuff throughout the years and said, yeah, I'm going to write a book on this sometime. And uh, how did you do your research back then? Well, my friend, you've taken me back to the dark ages, <laughs> just like that. All right, when I was in high school, well, my writing, I, my writing is, handwriting is not that great. So I resolved in high school that I was going to learn how to type if I wanted to do anything. So I, I survived my typing course in high school, Alexander Compass at High. And that's good. So then when I get a, my very first article was about the Cypress Hills where I live and eventually that led me to write my, one of my books about the Mounted Police Cypress Hills. Okay, so when I start to write about the, the uh, Prisoner War book and then I'm, I have my one room shack in the Cypress Hills. I had no house, no, no garage, no life, so I'd get in there. So I have to do the hunt and peck system, right? because I've got the typewriter. Some of the people don't, have never seen the picture of that kind of type <laughs> thing. So I've still got my portable. Okay, so I'm doing this, except you're having to work with carbon paper, right? Mm -hmm. So you hunt, hunt, pack, whoosh, bum, 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 whoosh. Trouble is when you get to the bottom of the page, uh, <laughs> throw it away. Okay, well, what a difference from there to today. Okay, so that's how Prisoner War book started originally. Mm -hmm. Now we'll jump over in terms of the research, which is a long journey in those days, because if you're going to send a letter mm -hmm. to Germany or to England, you've got to send it off and you're waiting. Maybe a reply will come back in maybe six it weeks. Won't. Maybe it won't <laughs> come back. And long distance charge is really expensive mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. Well, in the research that I did for Prairie Wings in particular, I mean, God bless Donnie White, who now lives around Maple mm -hmm. Creek, when he was the curator of our museum here. And he deserves far more credit for what he did for the archives here, which leads to the mm -hmm. Esplanade today, as well as the museum. So in those days, I would go over to the museum. I'd come in from town, because remember, I'm f like 55, 60 kilometers out of town. It's just that mm -hmm. I just don't hop and go a few blocks. We then had to order from Ottawa microfilm. Then we had a microfilm reader here, so mm -hmm. then we'd go, I'd have to go through this and jot down what I needed, or the old-fashioned Xerox, or you know. Mm -hmm. So that became a very long haul in getting this book together. Now incidentally, of all the training establishments in Canada, whether Royal Air Force or Royal Canadian Air Force, this is the only one that has a book. Mm -hmm. And, and the form of the book, you know, it's like, it's, you take two copies of my prisoner war book and put them side by side, that's what's in this book, and that's why it usually costs more. And this is almost a detailed diary of the operation mm -hmm. of the base. Of course, it also has a lot of other material mm -hmm. about the Royal Air Force, the formation of the Royal Canadian Air Force, and the and whole lot of background. Leading up to the war, the politics. Yeah. 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 So again, with this, then I'm, by this stage now, at least I'm, now we're into a computer, mm -hmm. so it isn't quite the journey of going back to the, to the old typewriter thing and, and, and swearing at the end of the day because of the carbon paper that, that messed things yeah. up. So it's been a journey. And then early on, uh, again with my prisoner of war book, after I'd been for a six week uh, writer's workshop in Banff, at the same time, I was dean of the cathedral, mm -hmm. archivist, and a whole bunch of other things, national, international committees. I, when I look back, I'm. You wonder what how the you heck was the, what the, what was the matter with yeah. me? <laughs> anyway, so it was there that um, when I studied under W. O. Mitchell, became a dear friend, and James Gray, uh, that I did have a publisher of, out of Vancouver who was willing to take my prisoner war book, except, except. I would have to travel to Vancouver in the midst of what I was doing, developing a senior citizen's high mm -hmm. rise earth? I don't think so. And at my expense, no, I don't think so. And have an editor. And the book might be out in 
two years. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, 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 I'll do this thing myself. Now, in order to do this, in order to get it in print, then you've got to publish it yourself. So you have to find a good printer, and then you have to say, all right, I'm going to pay all the costs, mm -hmm. which I have done on purpose because, as many of you know, that having been an MLA from Calgary for four years and then Speaker of the Legislature, people would say, oh, well, you're getting funding from the provincial mm -hmm. and federal governments. No. No. I decide, no, I'm going to do this myself so people can't say it's their tax dollars. <laughs> if somebody wants to buy a book, David, how can they contact you? Well, they can get me by going on the net like, like djcarter.ca uh, locally, and you can get them directly to me, and if you live in this area, I'll deliver them straight to your door. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Medicine Hack Co-op mm -hmm. on Southview, just outside the front door, there's a fine couple who sell Canadiana, mm -hmm. so they carry some yep. of the books. In the old days, and in Medicine Hat, because we have other authors in Medicine mm -hmm. Hat, God bless them all, that through the Esplanade, there used to be a bookstore, yes. which was great. But Surrey City Council, a few years ago, they decided to cut back on that, so that was stripped out, mm -hmm. which meant none of the locals had a place to sell. Uh, so that's part of the difficulties that you, you write stuff, yeah. it's labor, it's a lot of intensive work. Mm -hmm. And anybody out there who wants to write, and I encourage people to write, but the difficulty is then when you've done it, now you've mm -hmm. got to publish it, that's going to be money out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to go sell it face to face, because who else is going to sell it for you? Well, you've done a fantastic job, and I often run into you at local uh, <laughs> markets and that, uh, selling, and that's uh, how we often meet. And uh, we're at the end of our time right now, and. Thank you very much, uh, David, for your interesting view. Mm -hmm. And people who are interested can buy a copy of Prairie Wings, or it's available in the library, too. Well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Don, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for joining us.